let me start by uh, saying um, hello everyone wherever you are uh, I think uh, he's, he's a global uh, network and we have uh, um, uh, members from all over the world in different time zones even our speakers are in different time zones uh, and uh, and uh, I thank I thank them very much particularly Grace and Michelle for being up at unfriendly hours but um, so welcome to this uh, to this session of Inkai Talks. Um, uh, Inkai Talks is Inkai's uh, series of webinars where we aim to connect our membership with the broader international higher education and quality assurance community to discuss today's pressing issues. So my name is Fabrista Trefiro. I'm uh, an Inkai board member. Uh, I'm head of um, uh, international um, engagement and quality reviews at ECTIS, which is the agency that manages the UK qualification recognition functions, and I'll be your chair for today's session. This session looks at the issue of employability from a quality assurance perspective. Um, so we will uh, discuss uh, overarching questions such as uh, the role of employability considerations in internal and, ex and external quality assurance, and how quality assurance can improve the employability of graduates and their progression to employment. I'm delighted to introduce four excellent panelists who will help us unpacking uh, some of these issues, we're reflecting on these issues, providing different perspectives. Um, Michaela Martin, Assistant Director of UNESCO International Institute for Education and Planning. Grace Franco, a Steering Committee Member at the Global Student Forum and National Welfare Officer for the National Union of Students in Australia. It is half past midnight where she is on the 1st of December. So, so I will uh, thank you very much again, Grace, for staying up. Uh, Michelle Daisy, Vice President at the Quality Assurance Commons in the United States. Very early in the morning for you, 6 a.m. So, uh, thank you um, as well, Michelle. And Anna Parades, Head of Internationalization and Knowledge Generation at ACQ Catalonia and a fellow Inca board member. So the way it will work is that I will invite each speaker in turn to briefly share their experiences and perspectives on the topic. We will then explore further in discussion some of the issues, challenges and opportunities. Now, before hearing from our speakers, a few words about housekeeping. We have muted all your microphones uh, to help with the smooth running of the event and your cameras have also been disabled. So we can see you, we can hear you, but we are very keen to hear you so, uh, uh, from you. So please do use the Q&A section to raise any questions you may have or make any comments at any point throughout the presentation. Uh, it is a great occasion to engage in conversation with some leading experts on this issue, so make the most of this opportunity. Also, the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available uh, for free access after the event. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Hinka Secretariat, uh, who in the background are making sure that everything runs smoothly. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Michaela Martin. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fabricio. I will start sharing my PowerPoint. Um, Okay, so let me hear from you whether this is working well. Yes, can you see it now well in full yep. mode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> thank you very much for Fabricio and for to, to Inquire for inviting me to uh, this talk. I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, uh, internal quality assurance or quality assurance in general and employability are two strands of thinking and in a way policy making also that are not always brought together. Yet I think that they have a lot of uh, interlinkages. And uh, so um, this is why we at the International, the UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning, uh, we started to uh, conduct a research on innovative internal quality assurance systems and employability uh, was one of the uh, topics uh, that we have uh, addressed uh, in this research. So um, let me start by uh, saying some words about employability itself. So in our research, we have used uh, a definition uh, which has been coined by Manse Yorki, and he defines employability 
as a set of achievements, skills, understandings, and personal attributes that make graduates more employable uh, and successful in their chosen occupations, which benefits themselves, the workforce, the community, and the economy. So he doesn't look at employability only as something that benefits the economy, but the society at large. So, uh, but he says also something which I find very important, uh, and I think which is also important for quality assurance, is that employability is not only about getting a first job, it's at looking, uh, it's also it's about looking at entire uh, work careers and at how uh, graduates uh, can perform over a lifetime. And so that changes a little bit the perspective on employability thinking. It's not only those competences that you need to, to get your first job, but it is also about being, um, uh, being uh, successful throughout your, your working life. And another thing that I think is really important is that when you, and which is important for quality assurance, is that when you look at the employability issue, and when you speak to different types of stakeholders, uh, they will have different views. Huh? For instance, academic staff and students and employers do not necessarily share the views on what employability is and then what also what academic quality is. So. Uh, I think internal quality assurance is also an opportunity to discuss these issues uh, and to reconcile different perspectives. Uh, and so this is why I think we have to think about a, a multi-stakeholder perspective uh, for internal uh, quality assurance. Now, um, what I think is a little bit the background to the topic is that uh, in the global south, we have rapidly expanding higher education sectors in terms of student numbers. So just to give a figure, in 2010, we had something like 100 a million students worldwide. And in 2020, in 2020, it's 235 million students. So we have this very rapidly expanding higher education sectors, but the labor market in many countries of the global south is not expanding in, and is not developing uh, to the same extent. And this is why the issue of um, uh, graduate unemployability has been rising over the years. So according to ILO statistics, out of 53 countries for which data was available in 2022, 35 experienced an increase in the unemployment rate of the most highly educated in the labor force over the period 2000 to 2020. So this, I think the, the, the issue of expanding higher education sectors and not um, proportionally expanding labor markets for, for higher education graduates is something that we have to take in account, into account. And it is a phenomenon mainly in the global, in the countries of the global south. So, so this is why we are also facing a mismatch between labor market needs and gradual profiles. Uh, and there's more pressure on, uh, on higher education institutions to adapt the education and training to labor market needs. So, so I, employability is currently seen as a major outcome uh, of higher education. And there is a strong political pressure, I would say on higher education institutions to take employability into account. And there are multiple opportunities actually to do so. And I would argue uh, that inter uh, internal quality assurance is one of the opportunities. Huh? So um, here is some data from the research that we did. Um, and we asked the question uh, to, we, 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 we constructed an international survey that was sent out uh, jointly with the International Association of Universities uh, to a sample of some 6,000 universities worldwide. And um, here is what we got uh, as an answer. So while teaching and learning is really at the center of internal quality assurance, graduate employability, I have circled it round here with a black um, line, is also one uh, of the orientations, but not quite to the same extent as the quality of teaching and learning. So I think that is already some of the, a little bit of a background that we have to take in, into account in our discussion. Now, uh, 
what we did also in our research, we reached out to uh, a selected number of universities, had in-depth conversations with university leaders, and what came also out of this uh, more qualitative um, part of the research is that academic leaders don't view uh, employability uh, to the same extent that it confirmed the it confirmed the the survey data viewed in to the same extent as as being part of the strategic orientation as academic quality in general and that depends of course on the profile of let's say it depends on the on the on the higher education sector on the policy context but it depends also very much on the profile of higher education institutions um employability is much is, is a much stronger concern in higher education institutions that have a direct link to the labor market like technological universities or, or higher education institutions that directly train uh, graduates for specific profiles in the labor market. Now, what we also heard was that uh, IQA has a clear role in enhancing employability in through two main mechanisms. Number one is that there is an indirect link between IQA and employability, uh, given the fact that if when universities have an IQA system, uh, that testifies in a way to, to their concern with quality, and that in itself upgrades their profile and enhances indirectly um, the, uh, the employability of their graduates. And there is a direct link uh, between IQA and employability uh, through the fact that IQA helped to build strong interaction between academics and labor market representatives. And here are the tools through which this can be achieved. So graduates can be surveyed through tracer studies uh, at specific intervals. So tracer studies is about uh, tracing uh, graduates at different intervals. It can be done six months after their graduation, one year or three years, and really finding out how they integrated into the labor market and how they view their education uh, in, in light of their existing jobs and whether they see any gaps. So it's an extremely powerful tool to investigate actually their um, the labor market entry and how they view their, their education. Second tool um, are employer satisfaction surveys. Uh, so here, this is a, a survey that is directly sent to employers and just to, to get their views on, uh, the, on, the, on the graduates and also how they view uh, uh, the evolving labor market and what, what type of um, uh, competences they see are necessary for the future. And then there are, there's the involvement of employers, professionals, alumni in the development of academic programs and curriculum. And the same involvement can take place during the review of academic programs. And here we have seen some uh, interesting examples. So I'm thinking about the, the University of Bahrain, for instance, um, having um, a setup uh, where uh, they have standing uh, committees actually for each study program that bring together uh, academics of the, of the study program, but also employers um, of the graduates, uh, and they are involved in, uh, in regular program review exercises. And then last not least, now the monitoring of internships can help to analyze the fit between academic programs and the labor market as well, as internships become a, a more regular feature also of, of, of academic programs. It's also important to monitor them and to see how effective they integrate within the overall uh, objectives of um, the, um, the study program. Now, just a very quick look here at the tools and processes used to, to, enha to enhance uh, employability and how frequent they are. So what we have seen is that uh, the top ranking three ones are curriculum development involving professionals, curriculum review, and the monitoring, the quality of internships are the most uh, popular tools. 
Yeah, and so maybe I'm coming here to my conclusion. Uh, I can this. I haven't had an institutional experience, but maybe I can speak to this later on in the in the question and answer. Uh, so yes, there are good reasons to regard employability as a major outcome of higher education. And the involvement of external stakeholders formally and informally in program review is definitely a good strategy to enhance employability. What we have seen, uh, and I think that is maybe an area for reflection, that the involvement of graduates, uh, which I think are really a, a very important stakeholder, uh, uh, the involvement of graduates in, in program review exercise is very, very, can be very, very powerful because they both know they, they both they both know um, the labor market or have an experience in the labor market, but they know also the study program. So I think it's it's really important to think about the involvement of graduates. And then last but not least, um, uh, I think finding a balance between a direct orientation of study programs to specific needs of the labor market in thinking about the long-term perspective, I think is also something important. That is the, that was the point that I mentioned at the at the beginning, you know, also trying to, to balance um, stakeholder perspectives uh, when discussing quality. So I want to stop here and uh, I hope I haven't been too long. Uh, Fabricio, uh, over to you. Huh? Not at all. Thank you, uh, Michaela. Um, you really s uh, set us off in a, in a great way. I found some of the, the things you said very, very interesting, and uh, I would be interested to see what other panelists eventually uh, think about these issues. In particular, I found uh, the tension that you mentioned between uh, um, employability, employability considerations and quality, in particular, depending also on the type of institutions, quite, quite interesting. And perhaps we will have time to explore that in discussions later on. Uh, and also, you mentioned mismatch about labor market needs and graduate profiles. And I do wonder to what an extent this mismatch is maybe increasing as uh, the the pace of change in market needs uh, uh, increases. Um, and I'm sure that some of the uh, of our colleagues will address some of these sessions in the presentations. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Grace to um, to share with us uh, this period, uh, the perspective from. Uh, uh, one of the key stakeholders uh, we, who are students. You know, we're talking about the employability of students and the quality of the student learning experience. Grace, over to you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Cool. Um, so yes, my name's Grace. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I am from Australia. I represent the National Union of Students Australia and also the Global Student Forum. Um, talking about the employability and quality assurance from a student's perspective. So a bit about the Global Student Forum. Um, we were founded in 2020, and we now represent over 201 student unions from, 200, from 127 different countries. And altogether, our constituency is over 30, 300 million students of both secondary and tertiary um, backgrounds. Well, we focus on a wide variety of policy fields and political priorities that are relevant to the lived reality of our constituents. The quality of higher education is a crucial element of our work and the engagement of our union and unions and membership from both a regional and national level are very important. So I'm happy to share some of the perspectives we've gathered from those constituencies over the last few years. Within our movement, the team, the term employability is seen as somewhat controversial given the developments in higher education that we've witnessed in different parts of the world throughout the past decade. Higher education reforms have taken downturns in various national contexts and jeopardized the autonomy of higher educational institutions, endangering independent development of teaching, learning, and research. If primarily steered by consumerist trends, higher education is at a threat of being transformed into a tool for the production of outcome-based knowledge relevant only for markets and the expected development of our economies. That effectively means that higher education is being price tagged, traded, and somewhat standardized, often becoming more fragile and less and less resistant to political and economically turmoil. 
and is too narrowed in terms of being unable to respond to the needs of society as a whole, while also turning higher education institutions into service providers, students into customers, and teachers into facilitators. Across the region's rising levels of employ unemployment among higher education graduates are one of our, the major concerns of the government's higher educational institutions, but obviously also very much for us as students. It threatens to demotivate young people in pursuing a tertiary education degree and lowers the trust of students in terms of the relevance of higher education. This is to say that regardless of higher education evidently plays a great role in raising the living standards of society, but some misconceptions of employability and of those purposes emerge here. Some of them have been identified by the European Student Union's paper called Employability with Students' Eyes Research Publication and are displayed here on this slide for you to read. We believe that it's of great importance to acknowledge that higher education needs to be tailored according to social needs, not primarily the needs of the economy, if it is to improve the living standard of students and society. It's been recognised that societal, economical and educational backgrounds of a family largely determine success of students in the higher educational paths. This is therefore clear that the ambitions for improving the relevance of higher education must be coupled with creating equal opportunities for all, regardless of their background. So for example, in Australia, we see that low socioeconomic families who have the first member of the family go to university, every generation after that is doubled. So for example, my mum was the first in her family to go to university. My sister and I are both at university now. In terms of student expectations, it's important to stress that employability is not a one size fits all context concept and that its understanding and implementation highly depends on the national educational and economical policies that are in place. So while employability is without a question crucial in the, is a crucial variable in educational discourse and also in the realm of quality assurance, we see it as one of the multiple purposes of higher education alongside preparation for sustainable employment, for life as citizens, in democratic societies, personal development, and the development of maintenance through teaching, learning, research, and a broad knowledge base. As student unions and student activists, we are committed to combating a utilitarian approach to higher education in support of the reforms that cater for the needs of society as a whole. In order to efficiently conduct such reforms, the quality of teaching, learning, and research needs to be strengthened and we need learners to be at the centre of the reforms that are taking place that enhance employability, actively involving students in curriculum design, quality assurance, and the governance of higher educational institutions. Students should not be treated as users of an educational system and neither as consumers. We're active partners who contribute and should help in the reform and development and quality assurance of the institutions that we take part in. We have first-hand experience and expertise as the ones who use the facilities and are being taught the knowledge by the institutions. Together with policymakers, higher educational leadership and quality assurance partners, we should aim to create common ground for discussions and encourage an objective approach to higher education as a tool that primarily um, is used for social development that includes economic and labour market considerations, but is not dominated by them. Looking at policy recommendations that we have as students, starting with the need to emphasise the difference between employability and employment. This should always be kept in mind in discussions and decision-making processes on a regional, national and institutional level. Employability should always be defined in a broader sense, taking into account outside factors such as labour markets, socioeconomic backgrounds, demographics, um, also inside factors such as the qualification frameworks, learning outcomes and deployments. We need to safeguard and promote multiple non-committant purposes of higher education, meaning higher education should not be designed to match the labour market needs, nor should it rather be tailored according 
but, but should rather be tailored according to the needs of society as a whole. We recommend to recognise in the complexity and diversity of educational programs, disciplines and professions when discussing enhancement of employability of graduates. Research orientated universities, for example, will have different approaches to employability and what that means to vocational education and training facilities. We need to furthermore improve com compability and coherence of different segments of education like primary, secondary, vocational education, higher education and adult education, while exploring possibilities for vet um, and higher education institutions in that space. Another important point is the link between employability and the social dimensions which needs to be strengthened by opening access to and improving success within higher education for students and learners from underrepresented demographics. A few more slides, uh, or a few more points, I should say. Um, a key recommendation to all quality assurance experts and agency representatives in the room, student representatives should always be actively involved in the quality assurance processes, implementation, self-certification, and referencing of national qualification frameworks. Learning outcomes should be fully implemented and student representatives involved in the designs of the programs and intended learning outcomes, as well as in the discussions and decision makings on assessment methods and criteria. Where it's not the case yet, student-centered learning should be fully endorsed and implemented by all relevant stakeholders. Diplomas should be issued to students automatically upon graduation or requested upon gra before graduation. It should be written in a widely spoken language and free of charge. The UNESCO Global Recognition Convention should be ratified by all countries and international recognition of academic should be endorsed. And last but not least, um, recognition of prior learning and student portfolio systems should be fully endorsed as well. So that was a lot of recommendations, <laughs> but they're all important to bring out from a student perspective. And so we thank you for your time and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, it was really interesting and fascinating to see, um, to see how you, you, you were able to somehow to explode the concept of uh, employability. So there is more uh, to higher education than employability. Employability is not a uniform, inequivocal uh, concept, but there are different views to it. Different stakeholders will have different views of what employability implies or the importance to involve all the key stakeholders students, employers, in shaping and oper operationalizing the concept of, of employability, including through quality assurance. And that is um, uh, that, that was really interesting. And again, a lot of uh, uh, points there that I'm sure we will follow up in uh, in discussion. Now, there is a question in the chat uh, asking, you know, we heard about internal quality assurance, uh, and then now we heard about the student perspective. They wanted to, to hear about the external quality assurance perspective. And that is, I, I, I won't answer the questions, uh, but we have two, uh, two, two colleagues, Michelle and, uh, and Anna, who works within external quality assurance bodies, and they approach employability in different ways. So we're very keen to hear from them. And we will start from Michelle. Over to you, Michelle. Hi there. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, looking to share my screen. Thank you very much for having me. It is an absolute pleasure to be a part of this international panel and hear um, what, sorry, uh, the way others are thinking about employability from across the world. Fabrizio, can you share, oh, can you see my screen? Uh, so here we are. Employability is qu educational quality assurance. Um, I am from Quality Assurance Commons. Um, we are an, a US-based organization. Uh, we are a nonprofit and our mission is ensuring all learners are prepared for the changing dynamics of the workforce and economy. Uh, our focus is to uh, bridge the gap between education and employment. Um, and we really focus in on the proficiencies that employers say are most needed, which candidates most often lack, and also are the most challenging to develop. Um, we refer to them as essential employability qualities. Um, we, they are the same, it's employability skills, non-cognitive skills, transferable skills, soft skills. 
Um, so our organization has actually been around since 2016, and we were founded um, by a guy named Ralph Wolf, who had spent his entire career, um, 30 plus years in accreditation here in the United States. He led um, one of the major um, regional accreditors, and it was sort of at the end of his career, and he was um, given some grant funds to say, like, what is next in higher education quality assurance. So they did some research and some projects uh, and what they came up was, with was employability. So we've been around since that time, um, figuring out how we can best address this. Ralph's um, and this, this group's initial plan or and vision, I guess I should say, was to be, um, was to be a programmatic accreditor or a programmatic certifier for programs that were preparing their students for employability. Um, we've kind of um, explored a lot of things and done a lot of things since then. We, we actually, we did a large national pilot with a few international schools. We um, had then got in, went into some states here in the United, uh, here in the US, Kentucky, Connecticut brought us in. And since then we've really been expanding nationally and also um, really kind of broadening our scope of of services and what we do. I'll come back to the need. Um, and this, this is an interesting point. Um, we know that it is wonderful for students to go to college or university and just be able to and explore and learn and, and have the world open for them. Um, that was what I loved about being at college. Um, but the reality is most students are there um, for economic mobility, or that's the way it is in the United States. Um, and we need to focus on that. And if, when we, if we forget about that, um, we start to have some problems like the public losing confidence in higher education. Uh, so we know that 90% of employers believe that soft skills are as important as technical or hard skills. Um, we also know that three in four employers report difficulty hiring with, hiring graduates with soft skills that they need. And we also know that in today's world with more and more software and technology, um, it's actually human skills that are rising to the top. It's digital skills and it's human skills. Uh, and that's not always the way we think about um, higher education programming. Uh, in the future, we know that Deloitte reported that soft skill intensive occupations will account for two thirds of all jobs by uh, 2030. Uh, and then in the last year, we've really seen what we feel is kind of a game changer. How will uh, artificial intelligence change the need for employability skills in the workplace? Um, <laughs> so for a very quick summary, we asked ChatGPT uh, and they said, you know, AI will augment human capabilities rather than replace them entirely. Um, so in this future of work, um, there's a combination of technical proficiency, but adaptability, creativity, emotional intelligence, ethical reasoning, critical thinking, um, and also domain expertise, which is where higher education is usually focused. And that's what will be vital for individuals to thrive in the AI-driven workplace. So we're really looking at, okay, what, how, how is, how is higher education, what are the offerings and how are things presented and what are we doing? And is it a match for, um, for the workplace of the future? In the US, there are a couple of themes um, that have kind of, or that we have our eye on, I'll say. Um, and that's or, uh, one of them, a big one is, <clears throat> excuse me, skills-based hiring. Um, and there were a couple of reports out this year that really caught our eye. Um, so, the, and there is movement from our federal government and, and even from um, some of our state governments to stop relying or to on simply higher education credentials um, as sort of the um, the, uh, the primary um, requirement for a job. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania, they had a new governor come in a couple of years ago and he immediately on his first day, he said um, there are 92% of the jobs currently, um, you, that is like the number one requirement is a university degree, and that is no longer. We will now be hiring based on skills um, and ex skills and experience. So the, there's a couple of reports that came out that were really interesting this year, um, sort of talking about skills and skills-based hiring. And there is an, an aspect of sort of democratization of opportunity. Um, 
we have this employability framework that everything we do is based on. We have eight essential employability qualities. You, they're not that surprising. You've probably heard of them all before. And then we have these five standards of care. And that is what our programmatic certification is based on. And it's really been adaptable. Um, we It's um, preparation of essential employability qualities, employer engagement, career support services, uh, student and alumni engagement, and then public information. Um, we have actually, we started out with this programmatic accreditation, we call it EEQ certification or EEQ cert for short. Um, that is like our, our primary, our flagship product, but we've really branched out. Um, we are doing employability skills badging because we recognize how important it is for students to, it's one thing to develop a skill, it's another thing to understand and recognize and be aware of that skill. We do a lot of professional development and evaluation and consulting. And we have really, I think, over these years, from 2016 to now, uh, we are still a sort of, a, we do, we do a cert, programmatic certification, but our focus is not as much as an accreditor as a solutions provider. I will say we, um, we know this topic of employability well. Um, we, know, uh, we know what faculty don't like about it. They, they've told us. <laughs> loud and clear. Uh, they know We know what their challenges are, and we also know um, very deeply what some of the really great and noteworthy practices are that are out there in terms of preparing students for employability. So we've got this flagship product and or service, and then we we're also doing other projects. We did a really interesting project this year on um, non-credit quality assurance for a university here in the United States. And I'd say our work is specific it is focused on employability. Um, we work with liberal arts programs, and then we work in CTE program, or career and technical education programs in prison. Um, and I will say that while we are not one of, our organization is not one of the major accreditors, or we are not a, an institutional accreditor, we're tight with um, with all of the, or reasonably tight with all of the accreditors. There's a ton of interest. We speak at their, um, at their conferences, um, and there is some interesting movement on um, employability as a primary measure of quality assurance. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, that is great. That, that is really um, a fascinating new approach. Uh, I've been able to follow some of the development of the quality assurance commons over the years. I think is a, is, a, is a very innovative proposition that you mentioned, and it would be interesting to understand exactly how you work with other accreditation bodies. And also, I, I'll just ask you a very quick follow-up question now you know, about your your last slide. You say you work with the other U.S. accreditation bodies. How does that, that cooperation? How does that work, uh, cooperation work? You know, we've really been doing a lot of. Um a lot of presentations showing, um, you know, we've been, we're invited all the time to speak at their conference, to, sh to share what we know. Um, and from a kind of business perspective, it's always a great, that's a great way for us to then kind of um, get some new clients and participants. Um, and so that's, it's been nice for us, but um, yeah, it, they, they all care about employability. They don't all know how to tackle it. Right. Right. Very interesting, and we'll uh, we'll continue uh, um, uh, in discussion in a second. But first of all, let's hear from uh, from uh, Anna. Anna, um, here you are. So you you will present a different perspective. Uh, yeah. You have uh, extensive experience. You've been leading uh, IQ Catalina's work around uh, employability, uh, extensive experience of collecting data around employability. So very much looking forward uh, from you, and then uh, and then we'll engage in discussion. Over to you, Anna. Okay, so, well, uh, first of all, let me share the screen, duplicate slides, so here we are. Okay, first of all, uh, greetings to all of you. It's absolutely wonderful to be with this uh, global community of Inquahim. So, uh, as Fabrizio has just um, told you, my perspective is, is quite different. The starting point of this presentation is that sometimes, uh, well, the first the first uh, challenge is to get in, to get data about employability, but the second one is then do something with this data. And the starting point of this presentation is this: sometimes you have data, sometimes you have reports about employability, and then nothing happens. So we have 
if I had to title this presentation anew, I would title it Tips and Tricks to Use Employability Data to Take Decisions and Improve Quality, because it's my business, quality is my business, and this is what uh, how we understand uh, the context of all this employability data. I'm going to, to do a very brief presentation about uh, who we are, just so you know where, uh, where we are in the map. And then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Catalan Graduate Tracking System and the employer survey very, very, very briefly. Okay, so here we are. We are in Catalonia, Spain, um, Barcelona. We have uh, around 8 million people, around 300,000 higher education students, uh, 12 universities, seven of them public, five of them private. It's mainly a public system of higher education. And our main activity is the assessment of titles and institutions. That's what our main activity. Uh, you have here the figures of last year. But we also do this knowledge generation. And uh, what we do is we coordinate surveys that are useful for the system to improve their quality and their relevance to the labor market. Um, yeah. And here you have uh, the, the, the these three surveys that we do, the graduate tracking survey that we've, we've been doing since 2001, each three years. The recent graduate satisfaction survey that which we carry out, carry out annually. Uh, and then the employer survey, which we carry out each three years. So let's talk about the Catalan graduate tracking system. Uh, this survey, it has three objectives. The first, first of all, is to assess the adjustment of the university supply versus the labor market demand. The second one is to help higher education institutions to adjust their training profile to the needs of the labor market. And the third one is to help the students to, to choose a degree and improve also educational guidance for those students who are already uh, enrolled. So we have three surveys, one for bachelors, one for masters, one for PhD students. We survey them three years after their graduation and we ask three things. We ask them if they are employed, we ask them about the quality of this employment, and we ask them about the satisfaction of the training received in the, in the university. Uh, from the perspective of their employment. So, yeah, first of all, uh, I added this, this in this tips and tricks section is what is not useful for, okay? Uh, here you can see uh, the evolution of the architecture's employment rate. And you can see that in 2008, it was 100% of them were employed and then it dropped down in 2011 and in 2014, and then it goes up again. And why did it drop down? Because there was the financial and construction sector crisis. Okay, so this says nothing about, uh, yes, here. This says nothing about the adjustment of the production of between higher education institutions and labor market. It says nothing about the quality of the degree. They weren't better before the crisis. They weren't worse during the crisis. And it's not useful to inform the future students because it's a degree that is six years long. So you cannot take decisions on basis of something that is not a structural of your labor market. So this is the first tip that employment and conditions of employment may not be related at all about the quality of the degree. And in this, um, I agree with previous uh, members of the panel. Uh, this second graph, uh, I, I think it's really interesting. It's a little bit complicated to explain, but uh, I think it's really interesting. So uh, here you can see in the horizontal axis, the ratio of demand and offer of places, which means that if you are here in this, uh, in this, mm, in the center, okay, in this vertical axis, it means that I offer 100 places, for instance, about whatever degree, and there is 100 students that want to do this degree, so it's one to one, okay? If it's here in the left, it means that I have more places than students interested in doing my degree. And if it's on the right, it means that I have less places that the students interested in here. And we have always, always here medicine, where lots of people want to study medicine, but we don't have enough places, okay? This is my system. So what we can see here in the vertical axis, I have painted the percentage of graduates that told that uh, to do their job, they do not need a university degree. It's a question. We ask them, 
for this job, do you require a specific degree and say yes or not? If they say no, we ask them, um, but do for do the job, do you need university uh, university training? And if they say no, they would be here, okay? So it's people that say for doing the job, they don't need a university degree, plus those who are unemployed. So the higher, the worse, okay? So in the top left-hand corner, what we have is those degrees for where we have very few the lower demand okay, of students. And furthermore, the labor market outcomes, they are not so good. So maybe we should reduce the supply of these degrees. On the other hand, in the bottom uh, left corner of this graph, we have those degrees where the demand of the students is low, but the results of these studies, the labor market needs is high. For instance, we have here engineering degrees. Okay, And on the right bottom part of the graph, we have those degrees with very high demand and with very good labor market outcomes. So uh, in, in this case, we would say that maybe we could increase the supply. So this graph, it's one graph very useful for program planning. Okay, This is uh, an example of only one page that we sent, it's private, this is not public, to the deans of each faculty in Catalonia. Okay? And what they can see is um, basic data about if the people are, are employed, about the quality of the employment, and about the quality of the training. And they can see in one page the values. Imagine this is psychology of University A, for instance. Okay, and you can see here the values. And here in this traffic light, what we do is to compare this degree. Imagine this psychology in University A compared with six other psychologies in other universities. And if it's amber, it means that there are no significant differences between this indicator and the rest of psychologies in other universities. And if it's red, it implies that you do worse than other universities, and if it's green, the reverse, okay? So I think it's quite useful, this graph, to adjust your training profile to the needs of the labor market, and also to benchmark your how you're doing compared to others. This is private, it's not public. Okay, and then we have the classic skills graph, graph okay? When we ask as graduates is to assess the level of training in a, uh, in a, in a battery of skills, theoretical knowledge, team working, critical thinking, creativity, and so on, okay? And then we ask them, and what's the usefulness of this skill in the labor market? And if this surplus, it usually is theoretical knowledge, and then if we have the deficit, okay? And yes. here we can see that in general, English proficiency is where we do have more deficit, and but also in written expression or planning and organization, and this data, it's quite useful in order to improve, to know what, what are the weaknesses of your degree, okay? So, regarding information useful for students, from my point of view, the key indicator is the science. skills satisfaction. If they would take the same study again, uh, to me that's clear. If it, I always uh, tell to the young people, look at this, um, yeah. and it's quite clear. But then we ask, if you wouldn't take the same program study, why? And this information, it's clearly a very uh, important in order to improve programs. One of the reasons that they can choose is because the design or the quality of the degree is not, uh, is not good, okay? So this is a very, uh, it's a key indicator in order to improve the quality of your degree and see what degrees you you are worth, okay? So uh, we have uh, lots of public information in this portal for future students, uh, for higher education institutions in a private portal. And also we have these indicators link with, um, with the dimensions of assessment, okay? Just to help institutions to, with the process. Regarding the employer survey, very, very briefly, what we do is we do this employer survey and we triangulate, triangulate this information with the labor market survey and also with the satisfaction survey. And we organize workshops and seminars for the same type of degree. So imagine, I don't know, uh, economics in the in whole Catalonia with the 12 universities. Mm, we meet with these people and we can, we end up with employability-oriented improvement proposals. And our flagship in this arena is the case of nursing. Uh, we carry out a survey in, in primary care and also in hospitals. 
And from this survey, we detected important problems regarding the specialization required in the labor nursing uh, uh, in the labor market regarding nursing. And uh, yes, it, it was created a focus group, a, a group which came up with a white paper, and it was included as a best practice. And we are quite happy with this initiative. And that's it for me. So let me close. Thank you, Anna. Um, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, you've clearly put in place an incredible uh, um, framework there for um, for gathering data and information uh, related to employability. And uh, if I may ask uh, a first question, and I guess possibly this is uh, primarily uh, aimed at uh, Michaela and yourself, Anna, but. Uh, Grace and Michelle, feel free to um, contribute as well, which is really about uh, data and information collection. So based on your experience, uh, Michaela, uh, particularly your study and uh, your hands-on experience, Anna, what do you see are, are the main challenges in, uh, um, in harvesting this data and information? You mentioned, I think, I think three main tools, uh, employer surveys, graduate surveys, and uh, traces. Uh, surveys, uh, uh, graduate tracking. Um, what what do you see are, are the main challenges in gathering reliable data around the, uh, those areas? Should I start? Yeah, yeah please. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Fabricio. A very interesting question. Very fundamental, and I think we have seen with Anna's presentation that uh, it's really at the heart of so many uh, discussions and quality assurance uh, included. <coughs> So um, I think um, one of the main challenges is um, actually the technical capacity and that is required when I'm thinking about, you know, uh, conducting these surveys at the level of higher education institutions. Um, this technical capacity to construct surveys, uh, to, um, to uh, analyze the data is not necessarily always there in the quality assurance office. And this is why it is, I think, a very good example to, to have a national um, uh, modality uh, like you have in Catalonia, Anna, uh, where, you know, it is in your case, it's the quality assurance agency uh, that, uh, that compiles the data, that make it, makes it available for quality discussions uh, in the disciplines uh, or in the, in the, you know, similar study programs in your sector. So I think that is really something which is really important. Um, what we know from graduate tracer study all also is that the response rate is sometimes low. So we have also issues of credibility, you know, of the, of the findings associated. Uh, with this, so these are, I think, I would say it's it's really the technical capacities, you know, that are often lacking at the level of higher education institutions, and um, the importance of having uh, solid uh, structures because. Uh, when you have quality discussions and you start discussing the data and there are questions about you know the robustness of uh, of the data and the sample and so on and this is this destroys the discussion from the beginning so i, I think that this this is why it is really important to to have reliable information but maybe later on we can also discuss you know the 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 issue of using the data anna you were also referring to this because when data is not used it's not it's not very useful so, I mean, maybe we can have another round of discussion absolutely. On, on that. Huh? Uh, absolutely. Um, Anna, uh, challenges in data collection, information collection, and in particular, if you think there are specific sections of the student population which may be trickier to reach uh, based on your experience. Yes, of course, international students, for instance. Uh, they are the, the harder to, to, to reach. Yeah. Uh, we, we we just changed the methodology last year because uh, at the, the beginning, since the 2001, we did only a telephone survey. Telephone survey are expensive. That's uh, that's a thing. But it what is what it allow us uh, around half of the promotions are surveyed. So it's a quite good response rate because you contacted the family and the family, oh, it's a university calling. Uh, they would give you and and it was good. But then it it began to fall down because mobiles, because they, they tell you this is, a, yeah. and it, it can it can fall down. So now we do a, um, an hybrid approach with online surveys and telephone surveys, and it's working very, very well. 
because international students, older students, uh, um, it's mostly with PhD survey and the master survey, we have been, we have seen an increase in the response rate for this kind of students. So this dual modality is good. And if they don't answer the online survey, then, it, then you have the telephone survey. Yeah. But it's it's a challenge, yes. And we also give an incentive and yeah. It can, it, can very, it can be very resource intensive, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And this is good uh, that we all the system goes together. It's also good. In, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anna. And uh, um, Michelle, um, uh, I was wondering whether you could uh, unpack a, a, a bit the way in which you look, you check uh, how different programs embed employability skills and to what an extent those uh, uh, the type of information and data that Michaela and Anna were talking about uh, play a part in your um, in your quality assurance scheme. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it's important. I'll start by saying that because we absolutely believe that if colleges and institutions and their faculty are going to prepare their students for jobs after graduation, they have to know what they're completers are doing. Um, but interestingly, many of them don't once they leave, uh, they have no idea where, where they are or what their experiences are. Um, in terms of our framework, um, category five uh, uh, is um, transparency of outcomes or public information. But I'll be perfectly honest that even in our programmatic work, we weight that the lowest, not because we don't care, but only because it's so difficult and there are so many challenges. I mean, there's privacy concerns, you've got alumni dispersal. Um, so even, you know, it's one thing to track everyone in an institution. We know if they've completed or not. Uh, in the US, we've got people crossing <laughs> state borders. So now we've got states working together to try and um, merge their data systems so we can actually track people. Um, but like you said, there's limited resources, there's self-reporting bias. Um, and then there's the long time, the long time frame for outcomes. Um, and so you've got another problem there. So are, are we looking at what's happening six months out? Well, that's great for STEM majors, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. It's not the same for liberal arts majors. Um, now, if we look at that data 20 years from now, it's a different story, uh, but I, I find it a little bit of a bummer to only be looking six months out. So I'll just say that, I just wanted to say that I think it, the data is, if there's a one challenge, that's it. Um, that's, that's the big one. Um, so we end up we do work at the program level and we end up focusing on um, like basically uh, alumni um, uh, alumni engagement. And at the program level, it shouldn't be that difficult to get students, to track students, to keep in touch with them. I, I think the easiest thing is like in the US it's LinkedIn. I know there's other programs in, um, what is it, Zing, I think in Europe. But if your program has a LinkedIn page or a Zing page and as soon as someone completes, um, they're invited to join that. That is, you're accomplishing two things. One, you're keeping in touch with the students, and then you can get surveys out better, um, and you can see what they're doing, what their job changes are, um, and it's it's sort of like bringing in this aspect of um, bringing in all kinds of of things that are relevant. Now you've got networking happening, so it's we're trying, but it's hard. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, great. It, it somehow. Uh, relate to uh, some of the things that you were raising in your presentation, uh, as I understand it. In particular, you were questioning the extent to which uh, uh, employability should be the only focus of uh, uh, higher education, uh, often education. And uh, there is a lot of emphasis around job readiness, uh, that uh, higher education should, uh, uh, should uh, make sure that students are job ready. You know, from uh, I know that when you talk about student perspectives, it's a bit silly. There are as many student perspectives as there are students. But um, uh, representing the global forum, you may have a, a sense on uh, um, um, uh, you know, the main views and concerns or perspective of students around the world. So, what, what do you, how do you see this emphasis on job readiness? How is this uh, perceived by students? Often, students want unemployment after graduation, but perhaps this is not always the case for everyone. So if you can uh, share your views around this, this, this general topic. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, so I guess, like like you said, there are as many perspectives as there are students. And it, the situation differs for students in all the different regions of the world. Um, but I guess from what I've seen in the discussions I've had, there's 
there's a difference between what students want from an educational institution in terms of the education and learning that they do and res- like the, what they're taught in the university as well as the the life skills and relativeness to living in a society that that you also get from being in a higher educational institution versus also wanting a job or some form of employment at the end. Um, so I guess one of the big questions is how do you balance that <laughs> and and how do you ensure that students also enjoy their time while they're at university so that they have a good experience, so that they want to keep learning and so that when they get into a job, it's something that they enjoy. Um, I guess in in terms of your question about how to ensure that students are ready at the end of their studies, having a quality education is obviously very much a part of that in the sense of you need to know what's relevant for the job you're going into. Um, a lot of times, for example, in in some of the STEM subjects, students are taught the algorithms and they go, I'm 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 a, I'm a law liberal arts major myself, um, so I don't really know, but I've heard that like when they go into the workforce, all of those algorithms are automatically in the computer. So it's good to have that background, but it's not necessarily um, right. Like like you obviously need to know it, but it, yeah, there, there's other ways around um, the the education that you get. So I guess my point being that. The job readiness is somewhat very dependent on on what subjects you're you're learning. Uh, absolutely, um, <laughs> and, uh, and and sorry, Anna, did you want to come in here? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, because I was thinking, uh, yeah, that it's not only the individual; it's all it's also the context. I've been thinking about. Yeah, for, for instance, I was thinking uh, if, if you let me talk about Italy, for instance, the, the labor market of North Italy has nothing to do with the labor market of South Italy. Yeah, and, and but that doesn't imply that the universities of South Italy are doing worse than the universities of North Italy, you know. So in in, in that sense, I very much agree with, with uh, the student's view that Grace has commented before. Uh, yeah regarding the role because probably the the social the social dimension of south italy is higher than the social dimension of north italy because it allows people from a lower social background to get higher education and and, and get a, a get a good job so this is a complex um, feeling and and you also have to take into account this individual studies it has nothing to do with the labor insertion for performing cards from it uh, or medicine, or yeah, and um, and it's a uh, yeah. But if you ask students about performing as, uh, would you repeat the, the the studies again? They would tell you yes because it's my vocation, and I choose to do this because I wanted to become an actor, and that's what they wanted to do. I wanted to be a music, and 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 yes, that that, and then the labor market for music is not the same from the labor market for IT students, and that's it. Uh-huh. But they knew it. Oh, no. Uh, absolutely, and, and I was going to say that from what the, the, the four of you uh, share with us so far, I think there is a big distinction that, of course, needs to be um, traced between employability and employment after graduation. Um, and this relates to uh, to a couple of questions which uh, have been uh, raised in the chat, and uh, I'm going to address um, now. Um, so, um, uh, Zunorai can uh, ask how can we improve employability in universities in a country where infl- inflation is very high or Nora Arias ask how do we improve employability in a third world country where unemployment reaches very high percentages uh, exactly so uh, we, we can really use employment after graduation as a measure of employability which is the potential that um, the skills the competencies that institutions should provide students to flourish in ideal conditions. But they are important questions um, because of course uh, education is to also address uh, uh, the realities on the ground. 
so education institutions living in a more challenging economic situations will have particular challenges to be addressed and um yes um uh, so in, in regard to those two particular questions what would be uh, your answer the, um the very quick answer about those two questions i can i, I can repeat them to, for your benefit how can we improve employability in university in a country where inflation inflation is very high how do we improve uh, employability in a third world country where employment unemployment reaches very high uh, percentages uh, very quick i think we need yeah. an economist an economist here to answer <laughs> like you picked the two hardest questions in the chat yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they are different please anyone I, I was waiting for Michaela, but but uh, I, I... <laughs> yeah, maybe I give it a start. Um, and uh, I think this is, of course, a very critical question. Uh, and it is a major question that many countries of the global south are grappling with. Uh, so I think uh, that's that's something that we have to recognize. I also would say there are no magic solutions. And the education will never solve entirely the problem of graduate unemployment if the labor markets are not dynamic and if we do not have enough uh, maybe economic growth or you know a, a diversion of employment to the to the service sector so that we need more graduates, higher education graduates and the like. But I think uh, higher education has some uh, triggers. Uh, to 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 look for a permanent adaptation uh, of education with employment needs. I do not I do not want to say a blind adaptation. It's not like okay, yes, we need somebody with more digital competencies. It is, I think, a, a broader thinking where we have to ask ourselves. Where educators need to ask themselves, what is it that our graduates need? To, uh, to, to integrate and survive and, and, and flourish in the labor market over a longer term period. I think it's this longer term perspective that I think is really important. And I would say that the whole discussion about um, foundational skills, you know, having foundational skills and the adaptability of graduates, you know, the, 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 the capacity to learn, actually, I think it's particularly important. So I think in, it is with this perspective that we that we have maybe some triggers in higher education to respond. And then, for instance, then are some of the more operational tools, for instance, some of the programs they think about um, strengthening self-employment skills, you know, how, you know, that could, that programs can integrate, of course, how to how to create your own enterprise and this this type of skills as well. So that graduates do not get out of the labor market and say, so where is my job? But rather, I mean, what can I do to create my own job? But that is also something that it will never solve the entire problem of graduate unemployment, but maybe be a partial solution in, 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 some, in some circumstances. Thank yeah. You, Michaela. And Anna, did you, did you want to add something here? Or... Yeah. And I, I think in your answer to Michaela is very, um... Uh, uh, connected to another question I was going to relay back to you, uh, a question that was uh, 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 posted in the, in the chat, and which is, uh, uh, here it is, uh, it was addressed to Michelle initially, but I think uh, uh, it really it is relevant to what uh, you all said. Um, thank you, Michelle. Your presentation was very interesting. Universities must prove flexibility very quick reaction in correlation with the labor market. How can external quality assessment support this quick reaction? This is a question from Marius Gabriel Petresco. Yeah, so in particular, I think this is particularly challenging in today's context where there is a, a, a very, uh, we, we live in a fast changing uh, uh, work environment with new needs, new employment patterns. So how can, uh, uh, quality assurance, both internal and external, support institutions in uh, addressing this uh, this uh, change, fast changing uh, employment needs. And um, what would you be your recommendation, Michaela? Your, in your previous answer, somehow you already pointed to some of the things the institution may want to consider. But um, just op a question open to everyone: What could institution, what could quality assurance body consider to help institutions meeting these fast changing uh, employment needs? 
who would like to take it first. Michelle, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, you know, something someone said to me recently, um, I think is relevant. They talked about the pay, the rate of change uh, within higher education institutions. It's like um, it's like a huge cruise ship. And in order to change direction, everyone's got to be on, you know, <laughs> take off. Everyone's got to be on board. It is a slow moving ship. And in the, the rate of change right now, you need like a little uh, boat that's going through the swamp, um, putting out uh, what, doing what they need to do. Um, so it's difficult for universities, but I think that the one solution is employer engagement. And that doesn't mean doing one survey of employers and taking what they said and using it for the next 10 years or five years or even three years. There needs to be continuous feedback loops. And so from a quality assurance perspective, I think it's examining those relationships and those feedback loops. So it's not a once a year chicken dinner and we come in and give a presentation. It's really um, having employers look at the learning outcomes um, on a continuous basis and approaching things that way. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Anyone else would like to, to address this point? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Michelle. Uh, I think that, but it depends on the degrees again. I mean, it, it, not all the degrees have, um, yeah, the, the relationship with the labor market uh, that that some professional degrees more more oriented, more professional oriented have than than others. And uh, I I was thinking about this nursing employer uh, and employer survey. We discovered that. Uh, the, in the sector of nursing, there were more difficulties in recruiting than in IT. And it was like, oh my God, what's happening there? Because we, we, we produce a, a lot of, of nurses. And what happened was that they, nowadays, uh, the nurses that are in, um, in hospitals, in emergency, have nothing to do that those come that work in labs and nothing to do that work that with those that work in oncology. And so this, yeah. So these surveys are really useful, yeah. When you can do a little bit of qualitative analysis, yeah, and and, and the schools weren't aware of that. Uh, yeah, and this is something that if you have professionals, I agree with you absolutely. In 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 your program, it's something that probably would make you more flexible. But again, flexibility in, in long degrees, it's something that, I mean, I, I my co-credentials are much more flexible than, than long degrees because you really need to move. And it's really challenging uh, to move uh, the whole faculty. Yeah. You said something interesting there, Anna, because a, a way to um, to respond in a nimble way to, uh, to change in market and industry demands could be changing uh, education format. Perhaps the three years uh, uh, bachelor degree is not always the best format to respond in a dynamic way to market needs. My credentials are an example. And uh, and his quality assurance is a quality assurance community ready uh, to respond to these changing uh, uh, ways to offer education provision. And to what an extent the existing quality assurance mechanism may actually hinder uh, um, the take up of uh, uh, innovative uh, approaches to education. This is just open questions that came to mind. And somehow the, the answer to these questions is, is, uh, is related to a question which has been posted just now by uh, Nakebula Jogazai. In what specific ways can robust quality assurance framework within tertiary education institutions align with the industry standards to bolster, to bolster graduate readiness for the workforce? So it, it is possibly a very similar question to, to, to the previous one, and I believe that, um, that answered that. Now, there was another um, a question that was posed on, uh, um, on the Q&A, and that was for Grace in particular. Question from Grace, what do you understand by self-certification? Uh, can you give some detailed perspectives? Uh, possibly this refers to something you said in your presentation. Um, I, I can't recall. I, are you happy to answer that? I, I, I'm not sure I understand it completely. I don't know whether you understand um, it. <laughs> I'm just looking for the question, sorry. Yeah. What do you understand by self-certification? I'm not sure yeah. I said that. No, per perhaps it needs, it needs clarifying. Uh, if the person who has the question could, uh, um, could clarify uh, uh, that question. Um, Amir Sajat Khan, um, 
uh, as just posted something. It is about the role of external quality assurance mechanism and the, the impact on employability for the accreditation bodies. Uh, 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 I here. How can we address this matter? Okay, let's, let's have a look. Let's try to understand the question. Um, the limit involvement rather in critical reviews. Sorry, the question wasn't posted to everyone. I think it was sent directly to you. It, it was a, it was a, uh, addressed to everyone in the Q and A section. Um, oh, um, okay. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm in the wrong part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I completely understand uh, uh, the question from Amir Shazad Khan. Again, if you want to rephrase it, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, I've I've got um, a list of questions and I start to <laughs> to go through them. Uh, there's one in particular for Michelle because uh, your what the quality assurance commons uh, are doing um, uh, at the moment, I seem to understand, is very much focused to the United States. Uh, but to what an extent do you see uh, those essential employability qualities that you're using to review educational programs applicable internationally, for example? And do you see any particular challenge or anything that, that should be changed in order to apply that framework somewhere else? Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> I think that the employability, what we've found so far is that our employability framework um, is very powerful and also very adaptable. The way that framework is um, uh, implemented, um, it differs uh, depending on whether we are, you know, depending on the institution and the program. A university is different th than a community college, which is different than um, career and technical education. Computer science program is different than a history program, which is different than a nursing program. Um, and we're very good at kind of adapting and customizing our work. Now, work and social cultures are different in different countries. There's no question. At the same time, even work and social cultures are different in the United States. Um, I the I like I started my work in um, corporate America, and I got one certain type of feedback, uh, and that was you're not aggressive enough. You're not aggressive enough. You're not aggressive enough. And then I moved into um, like higher education and nonprofit, and the feedback I got was whoa, you are way too aggressive. <laughs> so I just think having an under, um, exploring the different uh, cultural context of whether it's an institution or a country is something that, uh, you know, you're kind of aware of and looking for from the start. So it would be really interesting to explore. I would feel extreme, I've, I've lived in Europe. I would feel extremely confident in working probably in, in Europe um, and, you know, Australia. I've also spent um, a reasonable, a little bit of time in um, Japan, Asian countries. And actually I will say that that culture is so different, so um, wonderful, but also very different. Um, I, I mean, look, and we probably always bring in um, uh, advisors from those countries, but um, yeah. And, I, and I've never been to African countries and, and I don't know what I don't know there. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. And then now I'd like to, to go back to, um, to the question, Michaela, that you were suggesting, uh, an area that we should be discussing, which is about the use of data. So we collect all the data about um, uh, employment after graduation, employee satisfaction, student satisfaction. How, what, 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 what would you see as a good and best practices with, uh, in, in using that data within institutions and, and, uh, and uh, colleagues within quality assurance bodies uh, and some of those challenges. We already touched upon some of this, but let, let, let's uh, let's unpack this this topic a bit uh, a bit further. Uh, Michaela, would you like to start? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, I think it's a very important question, and um, yeah. I think we so number one is the availability of different data sets, and that is that is very important. We have said that already. And then um, really are uh, trying to uh, put them together in, uh, in, in readable formats for people also who are 
you know, we'll be discussing quality uh, within, uh, you know, uh, a department uh, and uh, maybe in a, a, even at the level of a higher education institution, but who are not necessarily labor market experts. And uh, so in a way, I think there is a, is a very important task to be performed, which is to make data readable and put it in appropriate formats. So I think that's a, that's a very first um trigger actually and the second one is of course about uh, the creation of opportunities to discuss the data and uh, bringing uh, together different stakeholder perspectives uh, for the discussion of the data um, so the typical opportunity and quality assurance that we are having is program review also every four or five years we are reviewing academic programs uh, typically at the faculty or even at the department level. So we have a kind of self-assessment. And uh, I think if the quality assurance, uh, a, um, not agency, uh, office uh, at, the, at an institution can prepare data sets, uh, readable data sets for, for those people who will sit together and also convene, um, let's say, a, a format for, for the review pro, uh, process that brings together different stakeholders, including employers uh, and, and academics and the students, of course. I think they are, as Grace has said, they are the, the, you know, the beneficiaries of, of higher education and a very important stakeholder in the system. And then one can sit together and review a program in an evidence-informed uh, evidence manner, I think that is a very important trigger. So I, think I just want to put this yeah, and yeah. Uh, lay this on the table. And, Absolutely. Uh, and then, yeah. of course, Anna has suggested also maybe the kind of nationally, or, or let's say in, in her case, a regionally organized discussion across universities um, of, a, of a particular study program. I think that's also something really powerful. Yeah. So it is really about uh, using that data information to inform reasoned discussion among the key stakeholders within an institution or within a whole higher education sector. And I guess when it comes to a, a national agency such as yourself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, or do you have, what, what kind of views really uh, do you, um, Aqua Catalonia make of the data information that you help gathering. Yeah, that, that's what that was. I was trying to to yeah. share with you yeah. with the yeah. with the with the presentation. But this is uh, at the moment our battle. I mean, because we already have data. So uh, at the at the moment the battle is this one, and here the context is very important because right. uh, we are mainly a public uh, university system. So once you have a degree. Um, it doesn't matter if their data is not so good, uh, because it's not a private institution that is worried about, uh, you know, the uh, if they have students, they have fewer students, it maybe it doesn't matter, but they already have the teachers working on that, and the teachers love what they are teaching, and yeah, uh, and, and yes, they, are, they, are, they continue producing whatever they are doing. So, yeah, the problematic is is difficult. It's different. It's different from a from a, another another kind of another kind of, of system. But I would say that uh, from what I've seen also in other discussions, uh, um, discussions about the Eurograduate Survey, for instance, and uh, also ministries in Europe now they they are collecting very very useful information um, following um, administrative data. Okay, and, and they are they are really getting very strong database with information about if graduates are working and with them, which kind of companies and even the salary with administrative data. So this means the whole population, not a sample. Okay, so it's very powerful data. And uh, the challenge is that they have it um, and they have it. I mean, uh, it's there. And, and then uh, their message is, Look for it. We have lots of information. And then people who is designing a study, uh, they have to be aware where is this database and they might find something useful or not, but they have to look for it and this is not going to happen. Right. Uh, so this is the, the main challenge at the moment. So there are, for instance, I have lots of information in my in, yeah, in, in my web page. But people nowadays, they do not have time to look for information. So you have to find one page report to them. Uh, at the moment, they need it. Not, um, you know, um, when I produce the survey. At the moment, they need it. 
And the only ones that really can do this is the internal quality assurance units. You know, they are the, the ones that have to know uh, which data is needed and when. And here, regarding this question that was in, in the chat, is when planning the titulation and when reviewing this titulation in this deming cycle of plan, do, check, uh, plan, do, act, check, uh, you have to use this data when planning a degree and then when reviewing this degree. It's when you need this information to, to make sure that your program is as better as it can. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Um, that, that was very comprehensive. I don't know whether uh, other colleagues would like to, to chip in here. Otherwise, I've reread the questions that, um, um, that Amir um, posed to us, and I think really what, what he was uh, getting at is that sometimes uh, accreditation bodies may actually pose limits to the extent to which uh, curricular uh, programs can be reviewed. So sometimes institutions having to implement uh, curricula from particular accreditation bodies may, may be limited to the extent to which they can involve students or employers in reviewing the curriculum. So in those cases, and I believe this is uh, uh, the case of Pakistan, it is awarding bodies or, or particular accreditation bodies that need to lead in, uh, uh, in stakeholder engagement to make sure that uh, uh, the programs that they require institutions or delivery institutions to offer uh, are, are, are meeting uh, changing market demands. Um, now, um, I'll, uh, I think there's another question. Yeah, I think th th that was it. Uh, okay, so um, we are we are really um, nearing the end of the session. I wanted to uh, remind uh, um, delegates that uh, there was a question about it that this session has been recorded and that it will be shared after the event. Uh, I would like to remind uh, people that uh, um, uh, there will be other Inkai talks coming soon. So there is a pipeline of Inkai talks. Do check our website. To look at the at the next uh, next event, and also if you, on our website there is a um, a series of uh, um, uh, calls. There, there's a call for a proposal for our Inca 2024 uh, forum, uh, which will take place in Bucharest, Romania, uh, in uh, in June. Um, so if you if you're interested in speaking at that event, please do have a look and 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 put in a proposal. Um, there are calls for. Uh, funding opportunities to funding um, a small size project in, in quality assurance. Do have a look at it. Um, we've also opened a call for proposal for agencies, interested agencies, to host the 2026 Inkai Forum. Uh, so have a look at it if you're interested. And we are carrying out uh, at the moment a global study on different uh, uh, national institutional approaches to quality assurance. There is a survey. Uh, which uh, can be answered by quality assurance bodies or education institutions. So please do check that as well. And and with this, uh, it just remains to me to thank uh, the panelists. Great, thank you very much for staying up so late. Uh, I, I hope you have a, a very good uh, good night's sleep. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for joining us so early. I hope you have a great cup of coffee now and well-deserved one. And Michaela, Anna, um, very good afternoon to you and thank you again for for your input thank you for fabrice and the secretariat for, thank you for, for sharing putting together this great session and thank you all for for joining in for asking questions and uh, i look forward to to the next thing i talk and engaging with you all in the future <laughs>